Good morning. Good morning. There we go. It's time to wake up. All right, welcome to the CMS 2015 Medicare Advantage and Prescription Drug Plan Fall Conference and Webcast. My name is Stacy Plizga, and I will be moderating the event today. This morning, we are gathered at the CMS Central Office Auditorium in Baltimore, where the webcast is originating from. And I have to say, I'm so glad to be back. I just love to be here in Baltimore. We have a number of CMS experts, subject matter ex experts, who will share with us today their knowledge and expertise. In addition to the upwards of 300 individuals that are joining us in-house, it's great to see so many of you here, we also have over 3,300 who are joining us for the webcast. So welcome to all of our webcast viewers also who are joining us some at a very early hour. We would like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us today for this very important event that will provide information regarding updates to existing Medicare policies, new policies, policy updates, and technology updates. Our experts will also provide enrollment and eligibility understanding for various Medicare beneficiaries. Before we get started, I would like to review a few logistical elements that may be helpful to you throughout the day. Webcast materials are available at the CTEO website that is listed here on the screen. If you have not done so already, you can go to that site and you can download the materials and follow along with us. Questions. If you have a presentation-related question, for our webcast viewers, you will go to the Survey Monkey link that is on the screen and was also emailed to you today, this morning. And the participant instructions are also in that email. And you can go to that link and enter your question for each session. Due to the number of participants that we have with us today, we do ask that you limit your question to one per session. Here we have an example of the SurveyMonkey screen that you will go to to enter your question. It asks for your name, your email address, and then the session name, and then go ahead and enter your question. We will either answer these questions um, today during the Q&A portion, and if we don't get to them, we will then answer them and post them on the website. For our in-house participants, we have two microphones set up in the center aisle. When you have a question, you can just get up and move to that microphone and speak into it so that all of our viewing audience and in-house audience can hear your question. If you are having technical difficulties joining us today or you have a technical question regarding the conference or the webcast, please send an email to cteotechsupport at cms.hhs.gov and we have people standing by that will help you out. We are glad to have all of you here with us today, both our in-house audience and our virtual audience. Our agenda today is packed with many subject matter experts who are very excited to share their knowledge with you and their experiences today. We do, as I said, have a packed agenda, so we will stay on time throughout the day. And with that said, to keep us on time, let's go ahead and get started. Kicking things off for us this morning is the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Medicare, Sean Cavanaugh. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you everybody for being here, whether in person or by the web. I just wanted to perform one function today, which was to greet you here today, and thank you for coming, and thank you for all the great work you do in the Medicare Advantage and the Prescription Drug Program. 
Um, in this auditorium a few weeks back, we collectively as CMS employees and some of our former administrators, we came together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Medicare statute and the Medicaid statute. And it was a fun event and we reflected on many of the successes of the program over the years and the incredible popularity of these programs. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that um, a lot of this success and a lot of this popularity is due to our partnership with you, that you are an important part of the Medicare program, you're a growing part of the Medicare program, and we appreciate that. Um, we hope you, as we do, take great pride in your role in Medicare and understand that with that pride and with the role comes a lot of responsibility um, to be the stewards of this amazing program. The, la the only other thing I want to say, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about it in the coming hours, is we made a number of commitments to you in the, in la in the past couple months, and we are going to fulfill those commitments, and work is underway. Um, I wanted to call out a couple specific ones where we've made s real progress. Um, a number of the plans had come to us and s said that the socioeconomic status of the beneficiaries were affecting how they performed under STARS. We've taken that very seriously. We've commissioned s significant research. We've solicited your input. Um, you're going to hear more about it today, but we shared with you just two days ago the update on our research. And I want to assure you that was a commitment we made. It comes from the administrator all the way down through our staff, and we're going to follow through on that. Um, we made a similar commitment to explore. A number of plans have, for years now, claimed that our risk adjustment system doesn't properly pay for duels. Um, we're doing research in that area. We hope to have something to share with you soon. So um, again, following through on our promises to you. We uh, welcome you here today. We look forward to a productive day. Um, as we move into next year, I think you'll see that the, the program continues its great success. We'll soon be releasing the landscape. Um, it'll have good news. It'll continue the trends we've seen in enrollment and premiums and more importantly in the quality of care our beneficiaries are receiving. So we thank you for your important work in those areas. We thank you for joining us today. We look forward to another great year working with you. So have a good day and thank you. Hey, thank you, Sean, for getting us started this morning. Next, we have the Deputy Director for the Center of Medicare. She will provide an overview of the Center for Medicare Parts C and D groups. Please welcome Cynthia Tudor. Again, I want to echo how much we appreciate your being here today. Um, I understand that there had been a similar presentation to the one that I'm giving, the one, the one that I'm giving um, at the compliance conference in June, and I thought it was a good idea for you to learn who our senior leadership was in the Center for Medicare, and so that you can, you know, associate a name with a face. So, um, this is essentially the part of the organizational chart. Um, I'm the the Deputy Center Director for Part C and D. I have a, a peer, Liz Richter, who covers A and B as well as the ACO land. And Jeffrey Kelman, who many of you know, is our Chief Medical Officer for the Center for Medicare. We have um, essentially five groups um, in the Center for Medicare on the Part C and D side. We also have a business operations staff um, who, among other things, is responsible for putting on this conference today. Um, the five groups are shown here, and I have the leadership on the front row, which is great. Most of the time, these people have many other meetings, so it's nice that they were able to attend. So we'll start with the Medicare Drug Benefit and C&D Data Group, and their main tasks are outlined here. I'll just uh, say a couple of other things. Um, this group handles most of the operations for Part D, excluding enrollment and payment. Today you'll hear about another critical operational issue that they are responsible for, and that is Part D prescriber enrollment. But like the name of, of the group suggests, they are responsible for far more than that. They are responsible for C and D star ratings, and this afternoon, as Sean said, you'll hear more about that research on the potential effects of socioeconomic status on the quality ratings. Mudbug, which is what we affectionately call them, 
is also responsible for things outside of Medicare Advantage in Part D, and that is all the fee-for-service consumer assessment surveys, or CAPS, for the rest of the agency. And I'd like to introduce the leadership there, and that's uh, Jennifer Shapiro, who is the Deputy Director, and Amy Larrick, and they are over there. Thank you for both of you for all your good work. Moving on to sorry, moving on to the Medicare Contract Administration Group or MCAG, the areas of focus for this group for the coming year will include ensuring that all the Medicare Advantage manuals are up to date and that they reflect current policy and operational guidance. Moving forward, they hope to they are working on improving the provider directories, and again, that's a subject you'll hear about more today. And that's the primary means for communicating with beneficiaries about who is or not in the network. They are looking to make provider networks more real time and you'll hear about um, some of their efforts there. They wanna make sure that our marketing reviews continue to be focused on the materials that have the greatest impact on our beneficiaries. They are working to develop a compliance strategy to improve um, the, the activities of the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, they are making sure that our requirements are strong to ensure that benefits are appropriate and benefit structures are appropriate and transparent to our enrollees. And I'd like to introduce their leadership, which is Scott Streely, and he is the Deputy Director, and Catherine Coleman, who is the Director. Thank you for your work. The third group, is the Medicare Appeals and Enrollment Group, or MEAG, and this group is responsible for a lot of beneficiary-centered issues that impact all parts of the Medicare program. They serve as the lead for the White House initiative to improve information about enrolling in Medicare, in particular the importance of enrolling timely and the potential penalties for beneficiaries who delay their enrollment. They, they, they basically are looking on a new employer-focused employer webpage on CMS.gov to help educate employers and employees about when and how to enroll in Medicare. They coordinate the development of Medicare in the marketplace, frequently asked questions concerning a range of issues, things like general enrollment, ESRD, and coordination of benefit. This group, like Mudbug, has responsibilities outside of Part C and D, including the operations of the FIFA Service Appeal System. And I'd like to introduce their leadership, which is Michael Krachunas, he's the Deputy Director, and Ara Tabe Bedward, who is the Director. Thank you for your work. The Medicare Plan Payment Group is our fourth group. And they are the business owner of many of the systems that you know and love and how you get your, your money from us. The Medicare Advantage Prescription Drug System, or MARCS, the Automated Plan Payment System, or APPS, the Drug Data Processes, sis, Processing System, or DDPS, the Payment Recon System, or PRS, the Retiree Drug Subsidy System, Risk Adjustment System, Risk Adjustment Processing System, and the Encounter Data Processing System. All of those are these people's responsibility. When they go to sleep, I'm sure they have dreams of system breakdowns. So they are responsible for the Encounter Data Initiative under which CMS is now collecting detailed encounter data from MA plans. To date, we've collected and processed over one billion encounter records, so this is a grand uh, success on their part. These data provide detailed information on the care being in, in, administered in Medicare to Advantage. They are responsible for the development and implementation of the Medicare Advantage Risk Adjustment Model, and Sean referenced their work earlier, as well as the addressing coding intensity, another thing I'm sure you're all quite fond of. And they coordinate and release the annual rate announcement. I'd like to introduce their leadership, just right down here, and it's Jennifer Harlow, who's the Deputy Director, and Sherry Rice, who is the Director. Thank you for your work. Finally, our fifth and last group is the Medicare Oversight and Enforcement Group, or MOAG. Um, to date in 2015, they have completed 16 different um, program audits. They've implemented a new program audit consistency team, or PACs, to make audits more efficient and provide more subject matter experts in a consistent manner across the different regions. 
They have postponed two of the new audit protocols, the one on medication therapy management and network adequacy, until 2016. I'd like to introduce their leadership, which is over here, and it's Vicki Ahern, who is the deputy director, and Jerry McKay, who is the director. Again, thank you for your work. I was hoping that, again, ho still hoping that Jeff would show up, but he hasn't, so hopefully he'll be around and you can introduce yourselves. So in conclusion, all these staff and me are always here to help you um, and help ensure that our beneficiaries get the best care that they can. We are available to you uh, about your, for conversations about your concerns and your problems and your questions. Our phone numbers and our email addresses are widely available, and I can witness that because I get lots of them. So we urge you to contact these staff people when you have a problem to, to allow them to work, help you work th through these issues before you elevate it um, to leadership because, again, this important groundwork needs to be done before decisions are made. So anyway, I'm here to uh, answer any questions that you have and have a great day and have a great conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cynthia, and to um, all of those who joined us, the division directors today. All right, there we go. Um, just a reminder for our webcast viewers that you have the opportunity to send in questions throughout the day, so please refer to the SurveyMonkey link that was sent to you this morning in the email, and also there are instructions there on how to do that. So please take a look at that and send us your questions. Our next presenters will describe Aetna's experiences with, the, with implementing a Part D pharmacy tiered network in 2015 and the lessons learned while implementing this type of innovation to the marketplace. From CMS, we have Linda Anders. From Aetna, we have Terry Swanson and John Wells. Hello, I'm, in, I'm Linda Anders, and it's my pleasure to introduce Terry Swanson and John Wells from Aetna. They join us today to share lessons that Aetna learned in conducting outreach to beneficiaries and pharmacies after implementing major Part D changes. In 2014, Aetna pursued a Part D bidding strategy for contract year 2015, where Aetna distinguished its plans off, plan offerings not only by the traditional feature of price, benefit structure, and formulary, but also by pharmacy networks. To do this, Aetna adopted a new pharmacy contracting strategy for its 2015 Part D products, which involved developing a series of distinct networks and assigning each network to a unique set of Part D plans. To CMS's knowledge, this was the first time under Part D that a sponsor would not, own, not have one single pharmacy network serving all of its plan offerings. Also, for the first time, pharmacies that contracted with a Part D sponsor were not necessarily considered in-network pharmacies for all of that organization's Part D products. Consequently, hundreds of thousands of beneficiaries experienced network changes between contract years 2014 and 15. This represented about 30% of Aetna's membership. Implementation of this contracting strategy during the fall of 2014 and beginning of 2015 created operational and compliance issues for both Aetna and CMS. In the fall of 2014, uh, CMS learned that some pharmacies were confused about their status as Aetna, Aetna network pharmacies and followed reports in January 2015 of beneficiaries that were confused about where they could use their Part D benefit. CMS worked closely with Aetna from late 2014 through much of 2015 to resolve these difficulties. 
In doing so, Aetna and CMS gain valuable knowledge about the effectiveness of certain beneficiary and pharmacy communication strategies and of different approaches to pharmacy contracting. We also learn much about the expectations of beneficiaries in their use of their Part D benefit and of pharmacies with respect to the delivery of the Part D benefit. I believe there is much to be learned from Aetna's experiences, particularly when it comes to imparting information to beneficiaries and making sure that benefit changes are understood and acted upon. The information Aetna leaders will provide today will be a use, useful guide to all plans that may be contemplating making changes to their Medicare Advantage or Part D operations. So please help me in welcoming Aetna's Terry Swanson, Vice President and Head of Medicare, and John Wells, Vice President of Compliance and Chief Medicare Compliance Officer. All right, um, so thank you, Linda, first of all. And um, I'm gonna start out with a little bit of additional background. I think Linda's given a really good recap of you know, kind of what played out here. We're gonna go into some more detail about that and then also um, talk really about lessons learned and try to connect some of the dots for you that we connected during the course of the year and how we've um, changed our approaches and, and will employ um, new improved approaches going forward. Um, so let's see. So um, like Linda said, in, in 2015, just a, a little bit of the backdrop here, um, Aetna acquired Coventry, and so part of the backdrop of this was combining plans and combining networks for the legacy Aetna and legacy Coventry business. Um, so we were in the process of consolidating, decided to start consolidating our networks, and um, really wanted to create a single set of networks that we could use in our product offerings, um, as Linda said, to differentiate those product offerings. Um, so we did that. You can see on the chart here, you know, kind of what those networks looked like. So in 2014, we had separate Aetna and Coventry flavors of networks. They're not all depicted here. In 15, we consolidated and created a portfolio of networks that included um, networks with and without preferred pharmacies of varying sizes. Um, anywhere from, and, and the, the different size networks um, we refer, refer to as high value networks and um, you know, really were able to achieve different rates with the pharmacies, different price points um, based on the number of participating pharmacies in those networks. Um, we do th think that this is a really valuable strategy. Um, it was successful in terms of delivering value to beneficiaries. Um, and our example here is that um, these changes resulted in a 20% or so premium decrease um, for vir virtually all of our PDP members. And we had corresponding um, savings on the MAPD side. So, you know, it, it was a differentiating um, approach to the pharmacy network. Um, and we knew that this was a, a bit of a radical approach, a different approach, um, and we did um, develop a, a very um, detailed communication plan and a plan for preparing um, not just our members but other stakeholders. Um, we, we looked at a variety of strategies for communicating with members, um, with pharmacies, um, and also we knew that because this was um, a large degree of change, um, we knew that we wanted to inform CMS and make sure that they were aware um, that we were making these changes and how we were approaching it. Um, we also educated members of Congress um, and other um, officials just to, you know, just to build awareness um, in the event that there was anything that went bump in the night. And so we're happy that we did that. That was a, that's not on our lessons exactly. learned, but that was a, you know, that was a valuable thing to do um, because people were, um, you know, were expecting the change. Um, so, you know, in terms of member communications, um, you know, obviously we didn't want to rely on the ANOC EOC. It's a, it's a large document with a lot of information in it. Um, in addition to that, we sent a letter highlighting the network changes. I'm going to talk about what we're doing for this year um, and what we've evolved to from that. Um, this letter talked about the network changes, but it wasn't truly personalized. Um, and so we, you know, as you see towards the end, we've moved to a much more personal and specific approach um, in those communications. Um, we also did phone calls um, to our members. We did a lot of outbound calling. We sort of um, stratified the members by the degree of change um, that was going to be happening for them, um, not just limited to the pharmacy network, but also um, in terms of other benefit changes um, and, and made calls to them to inform them and, and help them understand you know, what those changes would mean for them. Our goal was to make sure that the members understood the changes and if those changes weren't going to be 
um, positive for them that they would have time during the AEP to make a change. Um, for pharmacies, um, we also, because we had been contracting with all of the pharmacies, we had a lot of dialogue going on with all of them throughout the years. Um, one, of, one of the things, um, again, that you'll see towards the end in, in terms of the PSAOs, the, the organizations that contract on behalf of groups of independent pharmacies, um, we had communicated with the PSAOs, um, but not directly with their affiliated pharmacies um, at this time. And you'll see, you know, kind of how we've changed in that regard. And then, as I mentioned, we did talk with um, CMS and other officials. Um, so there was a high degree of change coming. Um, we laid out a very detailed plan um, and tried to think of everything we could to communicate about it. Um, but as Linda said, there were some unanticipated um, reactions. So if you think about it, there were approximately 500,000 beneficiaries that were going to go through some type of potential change in terms of um, pharmacy and change of pharmacy. Some of our members and some of our pharmacy contractors um, had difficulty understanding those changes. Terry touched on the fact that one of the issues we found was that some of our PSAOs had not communicated or communicated fully and or clearly um, to their member pharmacies the changes in what networks they would, they would be in. So that, that did cause confusion for our members and members pharmacies it did result in complaints to CMS. I mean, there were both CTMs from pharmacies and from members, um, as well as direct complaints to CMS, whether it was to the central office or the regional office that we dealt with. And separate from that, we just had a minor change with a subset of pharmacies being incorrectly displayed on Medicare Plan Finder. And again, that led to confusion by pharmacies or members in terms of understanding that. Some of this was a result of having, you know, the four or five tiered networks that Terry showed you earlier. There were pharmacies that didn't understand the change, whether they had moved to a particular network and whether they were preferred or non-preferred in that network. They felt as though they couldn't serve members all the time. We worked with them in terms of how they could go about that. They had some misinformation that was going on because of what they had heard or what they understood. And there was some inaccurate communication happening as well, which we tried to address with them, both on a more global basis, um, by working with, with media, as well as on an individual basis. So the, the confusion here was just a lack of clarity. Pharmacies weren't sure what they could fill, and as a result of that, reacted when they could. And there were situations where a pharmacy would make an error in filling a prescription. They were allowed to fill that prescription, but felt it was because of this situation as well. So, you know, our lessons learned from that were over communication probably is highly advantageous in this situation. When you think you've done enough communication, it's always good to go back and test that to see if further communication um, is needed to the various constituents that are involved with this. All right. So um, we had a lot of um, complaints coming in, a lot of confusion in the marketplace. Um, as John said, we did a lot of um, activity immediately to start communicating um, with all of these constituents and um, really tried to respond very rapidly to this situation, which we did not want to have escalate. Um, we, we talked to pharmacies about which plans they were in, and one of the sort of the additional um, points of confusion was that with the new network structure that we had laid out, we had um, developed, you know, what we thought was a very clear and straightforward naming convention for those networks. And what was absolutely clear and straightforward to us was very, very confusing to pharmacies um, and to others. And so um, one of the things we had to do was really kind of revisit that and re-explain which networks were which networks make sure they understood which networks were connected to each product, um, whether that be a Part D plan or an MAPD plan, um, and that we had other books of business, um, group business, for example, um, that was not really impacted by this and that they could not just assume that because they, the, the pharmacy had tried to process one claim for one Aetna member that rejected, that the next person who walked through the door would be in the same situation. And so there was a lot of education um, that we had to do around that. Um, 
We also took steps to make sure that access um, was available to members and that the pharmacies understood that. Um, so we actually um, put in place uh, emergency processes for getting access to drugs for out-of-network pharmacies. That sounds kind of simple and obvious, but um, because of the nature of these changes, a, a reject 40, you know, for an out-of-network pharmacy is very, very high up in the claims processing hierarchy. Um, it's, it's difficult to override. Um, so we had to take some extraordinary measures um, to ensure that our members would have access to their drugs um, when they needed them. Um, and then finally, um, we worked on a solution to give members temporary access to our broadest network um, so that we could give them more time um, and give ourselves more time to communicate with them and to help them understand what these changes were, what actions they needed to take, um, as well as continue to work with the pharmacies to make sure that they understood as well. Um, and, you know, kind of in conjunction with that process during that time, CMS also made it clear um, to the members in the pharmacies that they would give a special election period to people who, um, you know, who felt that they needed to make a change. And, and that was an important attribute for members to be able to have an SCP if they felt they needed that or if their pharmacist spoke to them about that need. And certainly we encourage them and work with CMS for them to have that. Terry touched on one of the attributes we did, which was dealing with people who needed prescriptions immediately while we were going through the process of getting the broader network turned back on so that we could reimburse those pharmacies immediately and people could walk out of the pharmacy with needed prescriptions. While that wasn't as widely used as we expected, it was used by, by our members and it, and it enabled our customer service staff greatly to be able to solve their problems. We also had during that time brought on additional staff to work on our CTM volume. Our CTM volume had spiked and clearly when that happens, you need to be able to have staff that can do that. We were fortunate in that we had a large staff that we were able to detail back to CTMs who could work on those, make sure we met the timeframes and address those issues going on. And then finally, you know, we also worked with our pharmacies and encouraged them to resubmit. And while it took a couple days for them to see the resubmissions going through, once they saw that we had broadened the network, they could resubmit the claim and it would be paid, they, the pressure on them relieved them in terms of seeing that the, that the prescription would be filled and that they could service the member again. All right. So now we want to spend a little bit more time talking about, um, in more detail, some of the outreach plans um, and what we think, you know, we, we learned from this and really want to share with you as you approach other kinds of initiatives, regardless of what kind of change they might be. Um, so in terms of our approach to members, we, we had built our approach in the fall of 2015 to communicate based on letters and calls. Um, and we added some things to that as, through the course of the year as we, um, you know, just as we work through this process. So we continued outbound calls. We, we called members who used an, uh, an out-of-network pharmacy or a pharmacy in that temporarily expanded network. Um, what was different here, you know, if you think about the fall versus you think about um, now after the first of the year, what in the fall we were saying, hey, this thing might happen to you. You know, we want to let you know, you know, be aware that this, this could happen. You need to make sure you're going to an in-network pharmacy. Uh, in January and February, as, as we worked through these calls, as members used these pharmacies who are actually out of network, we could call them right away. You know, we could see their claim happening one day, we could queue up that call for the next day, and we could call them and say, hey, you know, you just filled a prescription at this pharmacy. That pharmacy's not really in the network, they're temporarily there. You know, here, here are some ones close to you. Um, you know, we could talk with them about making the change, offer them the SEP if that was something that was of interest to them. Um, but, it, but it is a much more immediate and personal um, kind of touch point than sort of the theoretical touch point that they had in the fall. Um, so we think that that's a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's just more effective and when it's timely like that. Um, you can't reach everyone. It's very hard to reach everyone by phone. Um, so we did also follow up with postcards. We, we did like big colorful postcards, something that we hope people would notice and not just, you know, toss into the recycle bin. 
um, for those who we couldn't reach by phone. And the postcards were not specific, you know, this is personal, you know, kind of healthcare information. So we wanted to share in the postcard, hey, we're trying to reach you, we're your plan, please call us, you know, and then we can, you know, we can help you and explain. And of course, we used email for those members who have provided us with their email addresses. Um, we also used our website um, to provide information about newly added pharmacies. So during this time, um, in addition to outreaching to members and, and providing expanded and temporary access, we also went back and, and started working with the pharmacies again to um, contract additional pharmacies and expand the network permanently. Um, and, and we wanted to inform members that that was happening and, and let them know that their pharmacy you know, may have joined. Um, and last but not least, and we think this is really important, um, we also looked really hard at our data to try to understand if we had any members who were in unique situations. They could be living in extremely rural places, we could have evidence that they're homebound, um, or that they just might have other kinds of um, special circumstances that, um, that we could help them with. Um, and so we identified those members and we put kind of a specialized, more senior team um, on calls for those people to just help them get what they needed um, to help them work through this process. And we didn't have a lot of members in that circumstance, but um, we're happy that we were able to identify some and, and take care of them in a, in a proactive way. All right. Um, and, you know, this approach was designed to reduce member confusion. Um, I would say, you know, now these are just the realities of the numbers. Our outbound campaigns, we were typically able to reach about 30% of members, but um, from campaign to campaign, those results varied. Um, so it, it, I think it's, it's really important to have multiple means of doing the outreach because you, you just can't reach everyone. Um, you might say, well, what about more than three attempts? Um, there's, there's all kinds of data, our own and probably your own and others um, who, who do a lot of call um, management that say your, your odds of reaching them later than that, are ju they just diminish. So it's a, it's a big diminishing return. Um, so typically more than three attempts is not effective in, in moving the needle of that 30% um, that number. Um, we used the colorful postcards, like I said, to reach the rest of those folks. Um, and we did see um, our complaints go down, um, our SEP volume go down um, as a result of, um, of these outreach mechanisms and the additional pharmacy contracting. We haven't really focused on that here because we want to talk more about communication, but you know, we were really doing you know, two things at the same time. One, communicating with members and getting them to make a change. Two, com contracting with additional pharmacies um, so that fewer members would have to make that change. And these are just a couple of slides showing um, the data, you know, in terms of SEP volume. And um, on the right-hand side, it's called gap network. What we mean by that, that's the temporarily expanded network. So how many people were actually filling prescriptions in pharmacies that should be or, or would be out of network. And, and you can see it, it really dropped off by the middle of March as we had gotten a lot of these mechanisms, you know, kind of up and, and running and flowing. Um, and the curves look very much the same on complaints and grievances. Um, so the, the mechanisms, you know, we, we believe were, you know, were very successful in, in taming um, the confusion and the disruption that we were experiencing at the beginning of the year. All uh, right. Um, so other constituents, um, in addition to talking to members, in addition to contracting with additional pharmacies, um, we did also contact pharmacies who had had a number of complaints with us. So as, as Linda mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, we had pharmacies who were reaching out to CMS and who were filing CTMs um, because they were confused or they were um, dissatisfied um, with the process. Um, we looked at who those were and we contacted them. Um, in many cases, if it was an independent pharmacy, we were able to offer them, you know, an a opportunity to, co to participate in the network on the spot. Um, if they were part of a PSAO, um, that was more of an education process. Um, we're going to talk, a, I'm going to hold that because I know we've got another slide on PSAOs and, and how we worked with them. Um, but um, we also, so we, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that these, um, these pharmacies who were not clear or who were dissatisfied, that, that we personally touched them and, and spoke with them. Um, we also started reaching out to the state pharmacy associations um, as well as the National Community Pharmacist Association. And um, NCPA was especially helpful to us. They have um, 
a very good mechanism for communicating with their um, affiliates. They also have a lot of experience with independent pharmacies and PSAOs. Um, so we started working with them and they have actually helped us um, review some of the materials and review some of the approaches that we use for communicating with their, um, their pharmacies. Um, so they gave us feedback on what, what would be effective. You know, should we call these pharmacies or should we fax them? Don't call them, they're very busy people send them a fax. You know, it, was, it sounds simple um, and there are things that, you know, may be obvious, but it was good to be able to do that checkpoint, but also to look at how to make the content um, meaningful um, and grab their attention because they are very busy and you want something that's going to really resonate with them that they can quickly look at and um, understand how to help a member um, at the point of service. Um, and then, you know, in terms of other things, we also experimented a little bit with faxing physicians. So if we were having trouble reaching the member, having trouble getting a hold of their pharmacy, um, we could fax the physician and say, hey, you've got this, um, you know, this patient of yours, we're trying to reach them, we're trying to help them get this filled, can you help us? Um, we had brokers, um, sometimes they have better contact information for the members than we do. Um, so a, a lot of these other constituent kinds of things are about the people that it was hard for us to reach, um, and some of these people are very hard to reach. Um, we had uh, really good results working with the SHIPS. Um, so the SHIPS, the State Health Insurance Assistant Programs, they've got a centralized unit who can disseminate communications um, to all of the SHIPS across the country. Um, they were able to absorb a lot of detail um, and provide that to the SHIP counselors who then can deal with walk-in patients um, and be aware of the situation and, and help them through it. So, um, you know, and, and we continue to work with Congress and, and others as well just to communicate what was going on. So, you know, I would say, you know, what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to find all of the touch points that could help a member um, make sure that they understood what was going on and get access to their prescription um, between member, pharmacy, and physician. You know, we were trying to kind of surround the member and then, you know, we also worked with the SHIPS and the NCPA and, and others to try to make sure that, um, you know, any, anyone who escaped, you know, kind of escaped our net um, would be caught in that next level of, of safety net. All right. Um, in our service centers, um, we also, of, of course, wanted to make sure that if someone called us, that our call center was prepared um, to handle the questions. And we did implement um, additional training for our customer service centers, including how to guide members to a network pharmacy and also how to um, understand if there was a pharmacy that was going to be joining the network um, that might not yet show up. Um, in our in our claims processing system, so you know, kind of using those web tools that we were providing about the coming soon pharmacies, um, and we also implemented enhanced call monitoring to make sure that those customer service reps were giving the right message, um, to make sure that um, per our agreement with CMS that the SEP was always being offered when we had a member in this situation, um, and and just to make sure that they were able to um, you know to respond to these questions. Um, this. Also probably sounds simple, I, I should probably mention that, you know, again, we're in the process of um, combining organizations, so we were actually training call centers at two different PBMs as well as our internal call center and, and monitoring that to make sure that the answers were consistent um, across um, the different parts of the operating model. So as you look, you know, we, we tried to anticipate the downstream effects of plan design and network chains. While we innovated in 2015, you know, our Part D network configuration, and it was generally consistent with CMS requirements, we did underestimate um, how members and how much member and pharmacy outreach we would need to do to ensure a smooth transition. You know, we did we would recommend and suggest that you look at testing with constituents, particularly providers and pharmacies, if you're going to impact them, how that's going to work and with their intermediate organizations. I think as Terry mentioned earlier, that was something we did not recognize um, would be an issue for us. Um, there's no concern on our part in terms of over communicating with members. We did recognize that after three phone calls, the effectiveness of finding members and calling them on the phone diminish, but that didn't mean we stopped there. We continued with the postcards. We tried oversized mailings. We found that oversized mailings of postcards were effective 
members responded to that. They called us um, as opposed to receiving a standard size postcard. You know, we, we looked at the faxing versus the calling of the pharmacy. We did a lot of fax blasts to pharmacies, but as Terry mentioned, also calling pharmacies seemed to be much more effective. It allowed them to engage with us to discuss their problems in terms of did they have a, a problem other than the immediate issue of how do they fill this prescription for a member. They expressed a lot of interest to us in how can I join these various networks. That allowed us to go out and recontract with them and talk to them about those opportunities. We also were able to clarify for them whether they belonged to a PSAO or could contract with us directly because, again, some of them didn't understand that as clearly. We monitored all our channels of communication. Every day we were looking at media, local media, seeing if there was a particular pharmacy in a particular area that had run a story or whether there was something on social media that we had to address, whether it was with a member um, or with a pharmacy. And we would take immediate action when we'd see those local stories to reach out to those members or pharmacies. Um, to address them. So I, I can't stress well enough the, the importance of looking at local media and social media on this. It isn't just the larger national papers that carry this. These are often stories carried by the local papers, local community papers, or their postings um, on the internet that you need to look at. We worked very closely with CMS to look at what the potential risks would be with the design changes. We didn't anticipate all of them. And again, we challenged, we challenged ourselves, and we did this as we met almost on a daily basis, to look at all the scenarios. So we would look at this as we talk through what is the impact on an individual member, because that, that was really the basis of our concern was, you know, we could talk in aggregate that members could have access um, to the various pharmacies, but what happened to a particular member, as Terry mentioned, we, as a result, we developed specific outbound programs to certain members who had special needs or what we perceived as needing um, additional help in doing this. All right. Um, so contingency, we, we talked a little bit about contingencies and, you know, one of our big lessons learned was, you know, in addition to looking, you know, kind of in the vein that John was just saying, looking really hard at what are the possible issues, you know, that could arise, what are all of the possible risks, and have you really, really thought about all the risks and kicked the tires, um, then, you know, it's really important to have proactive contingency plans for all of the risks that you can possibly identify. So, you know, we feel very good about how quickly we were able to respond um, when, the, when these unforeseen situations um, happened. Um, we responded to members, we responded to pharmacies, um, we moved very, very quickly, and, um, you know, the whole organization really came together to make that happen. But uh, hindsight is 2020, and, you know, if we had a do-over, um, you know, we would have had contingency plans for some of these situations and would have been able to employ them even more quickly. Um, you know, we would have, you know, certainly wanted to head off some things at the pass, but, um, but contingencies, just as, as example, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, can you override that rejected claim? Can you do it at all of your PBMs if you have more than one? Um, you know, th these are just different scenarios that, um, you know, that, that don't take a lot of time to work through, but, but they have to be worked through. Um, do you have a way to operationalize those things and can you do it quickly? So, you know, now we've got very detailed contingency plans. We can flip a switch in 24 hours to um, expand or contract our network. That's a really good thing. Um, but we had to develop that kind of in the, in the heat of battle, um, as it were, in, in January of this year. Um, and it would have been nice if, if we would have had that, um, you know, kind of on the shelf and ready to go, trigger ready. Um, now we have trigger ready contingency plans. Um, all right, simpler is better. Um, this is one of our big lessons learned. So we, we developed this wonderful portfolio of, of networks with these really straightforward naming conventions and it was really confusing to everybody except for us, okay? So simpler is better. Um, and, and we are actually simplifying um, as we look year over year. Um, the, the part, you know, I think, and you'll see it here a little bit, I mean, 
we really underestimated how much the pharmacies would struggle with this. You know, we were contracting with them. We were saying, hey, you're in this network, but not this one. What could be more clear? Um, it, it wasn't necessarily that clear. It might have been clear to the person doing the contract, but it, it didn't always get communicated down to the pharmacist who's serving our member. Um, and so that pharmacy communication piece and, and thinking about um, the product design, you know, not just from what's a good way to do product design and differentiate and provide a different value proposition for, for different members, you know, but, but how can that be really operated on um, by your other partners, the pharmacies who do deliver our programs at the point of service? Um, really, really important learning. So you know, we feel very strongly that both members and pharmacies um, benefit from a simpler configuration. It's easier to understand. Um, we've scrapped our straightforward naming conventions and have like boring naming conventions like network s1 um, and you know just you know simple things like that um, you know again hindsight always 2020 so all right and, and then direct engagement with the independent pharmacies so um, we talked a little bit about the PSAOs and um, the the PSAOs who again roll up a, a variety of independent pharmacies contractually they're responsible for communicating with the affiliated pharmacies in their networks, okay? They're, they're responsible for that. They might be responsible, but, um, you know, we, we found that it was a better approach for us to control that communication more, for us to engage directly. It doesn't mean we bypass the PSAO. Um, the PSAO receives communication. We provide them now with an advance notice of what we're going to send to their affiliates, and, and we communicate directly with those affiliated pharmacies so that they know what their status is in the network. Um, they hear it from us um, versus get, you know, to the point John made some misinformation as, a, you know, in the, in the void. Something comes in there, and it may or may not be the right information. So, you know, we prefer um, strongly to control that information, and in talking with um, NCPA, who really, you know, kind of consider the expert in that space, they, they also have really confirmed that they think this is a best practice, um, and it's really the way to go because these different organizations have different capabilities, and, you know, you want to have a very consistent experience um, for your members in your pharmacies. Um, and, you know, other independent pharmacies who, who don't um, work through a PSAO, um, there are a lot of them. Um, we have developed um, electronic tools um, for assisting and, and speeding up the contracting process um, with those independent pharmacies. Um, and we really try to look at it, and, you know, as recently as really over the last few months, we've continued to look at that electronic process and how we could streamline it, how we could take steps out of the process. Again, these are, these are small business owners. They're busy people. How can we be easy to do business with for them? Um, and so that's, you know, we think that that's really important. Um, but independent pharmacies, you know, you don't want to underestimate the, the influence of those pharmacies on your members um, or on the perception of your products. And then, um, you know, here, uh, I'll just say a few words and, and turn it over to John. I mean, the combination of approaches is really important. So no single thing um, got us, you know, the nice charts of, of decreasing complaints or decreasing grievances. Um, it's multiple paths to try to surround the member. It's multiple ways to try to reach the pharmacy and get them to respond. You know, you're trying to get people to make a change, um, to understand something new. And, um, you know, there, there's no magic bullet here. It's, it's a combination of approaches, mm -hmm. um, and some people respond differently to different messages. Yeah. I mean, for us, the, the thing that we really looked at was recognizing the strong personal relationship between the pharmacist and the member, and that's at an individual member level. So we would look at how is that pharmacist working with that member? How can we do an outreach both to that pharmacist and that member to address their needs. Sometimes we could address them. Sometimes, as Terry said, an SCP was necessary to resolve that problem. And we certainly, our position was we wanted members to be satisfied with their experience with us. We were looking very much for that. So, you know, just to reiterate, the, the calls, the oversized postcards, talking to pharmacies directly. We had a, a, a number of people talking with them not only about contracting, but about other issues that we could go on. And as we said, we did outreach both to the PSAOs and the various associations. 
um, as well as uh, as well as congressional staff that were talking to us and, and Council on Aging. All of those activities together helped immensely in terms of keeping people informed of what we were doing and where we were going. We were trying very much to be transparent in what we were doing. We recognized people didn't recognize our transparency or what we thought was transparent going into 2015. We didn't, that was not intentional on our part, but we wanted to make sure they understood um, that we wanted to be a good part, business partner with them as a pharmacy or a good partner with them as a member of our health plan. All right. And then customer service, um, you know, customer service obviously is our front line, um, both the customer service that we offer to members as well as the pharmacy service, you know, when they call our pharmacy um, help desk. So, you know, you absolutely want to make sure that the staff are prepared, um, that they're empowered um, to offer a solution versus, um, you know, kind of have to be in the position of just hearing the problem and not necessarily being able to, to solve for it. Um, the, The monitoring um, and advancement here in customer service is, is just, I don't know, it, it's really important. When, when there's a, you know, when there's a high volume of something, everybody hears it and they're trained and they're ready to go and, and they can respond and they get those calls often enough to be practiced at it. So, you know, I think the other thing that I would want to offer, because we have this situation going on um, each month, you know, as new members join the plan, they might not realize that not every pharmacy is in the network. So this is this is an ongoing thing, but but now, you know, as we've gotten through, you know, kind of the the busy time, it's a it's a much smaller volume. So I think the other really important thing for your customer service is to keep them fresh um, and to keep them um, you know, keep these kinds of things in the forefront because they they might not get not every rep is going to get that call every day when you're kind of in a, a lower volume steady state kind of situation. But when they do get it, you know, they need to be able to address the member concerns. They need to be able to check and see if this pharmacy is coming online next week. No problem. You know, it's, it's just it's a fairly um, detailed process. But, um, you know, I think the other differentiator is it's one thing when you're very, very busy doing a lot of these calls. It's something else to keep your customer service team sharp when you're only doing a few. Um, Part of what we did during this entire time is we had a daily executive debrief, and a, a good portion of that debrief was going over customer and uh, customer inquiries, customer issues at that point. So every day we would hear about various key CTMs or CTM cases, as well as customers calling in or appeals and grievances. And we were trying to look for trends at that point. Did we have more than one instance where a pharmacy was experiencing a rejected claim? when we had broadened the network. Was there something unique to that pharmacy and how they were submitting that we needed to address? Was there a particular member who was having difficulty that we needed to do additional outreach to? So we were looking at that avenues, again, taking it back to the individual basis to look at how we could address those while we were looking at the data overall to see where we could you know, decrease significantly the level of complaints. Did we mention simpler is better? Yeah. I think I think we did, <laughs> but um, we'll mention it again. Simpler is better. Um, so, so I want to spend a minute just talking a little bit more specifically about you know kind of how we see the communication um, rolling out this fall and what will be different. So you know a, a lot of the things that we've talked about throughout um, this time are are strategies that we evolved and fine-tuned um, over time you know as we you know we started last fall we introduced new tactics and and kept tweaking them and adding to them and changing them over the course of the year as, as we tried to fine-tune and get to something that would be the most effective um, and so um, we've had that opportunity to do a lot of experimentation get a lot of um, just a, a lot of experience with what worked what didn't work and um, you know, so as we approach this um, for 2016, and um, we have simplified our network greatly, but guess what? We just spent all of 2015 educating all these people about this really complicated network, and now it's gonna change again. 
So we have to do that education process all over. Um, hopefully it'll be a little easier because we're sending a simpler message. But, um, but realistically, it's still another um, high degree of change that we have to be prepared for, that we have to prepare our pharmacy network for, um, and our members. So, um, so as we look at this fall, um, like I said, last year we sent letters to members that said the network is changing. And they were, um, they were customized more at the plan level um, or at the network level. And so the letter would have a, a statement in it that tried to get your attention like, hey, pharmacy XYZ isn't preferred anymore. You know, but it didn't say, you know, Mrs. Jones, we noticed you're shopping at pharmacy XYZ and that pharmacy is not preferred anymore. So, you know, the approach um, year over year that's different is that the letters are personalized, truly personalized um, to that member's circumstances. Um, we will give them um, pharmacies that are close to them that we think might be convenient and other alternatives, of course, to look up on the web or to call us um, to, to find a, a convenient pharmacy. So we've, we've tried to make the letters very, very personal and specific, much more specific than last year. Um, we're going to continue with the postcards. Um, we thought those were effective, like John said. We, we find the colorful postcards effective. Um, and so we're going to continue with those. We'll also continue with the targeted phone call. So even though in the fall um, it's a little bit harder to be specific and we're, you know, because it's a theoretical, hey, this change is coming, um, again, you know, we, we will use our claims history. We will use everything that we have to try to make that phone call as personal as we can make it. Um, to let members know what's going to happen for them, you know, as far as we can tell it as their plan based on the information we have, um, and to help them understand what their options are, um, which might be staying with our plan, it might be going to a different plan, it might be going to a pharmacy that's across the street. Um, we also noticed, you know, as, as we've gone through this, that for the members who have um, used pharmacies that are kind of outside the network or that used to be outside the network, that many of them, uh, nearly half, also have used a different pharmacy in the network. So there's a lot of members, you know, if you look at your own data, you, you can see a lot of members use multiple different pharmacies. And so it's important for them to understand that they're going to get a, potentially a different experience, a different cost share um, when they do that. It's okay, they can, you know, that's, that's their choice to do, but, they, you know, you don't want them surprised um, by getting, you know, $5 today, $10 tomorrow. Um, so we try to make it very, very personal. Um, we'll continue to do the direct engagement with pharmacies. Again, much more simplified message. Um, the other thing that we, um, you know, that we're working on in terms of the pharmacy communication is we have other changes. Um, so we have um, uh, plan consolidations. We have a PBM change. So we have lots of information that we need to communicate to the pharmacies, and we're working with our PBM to make sure that we coordinate those communications and you know think of the pharmacy communication plan um, kind of along the same lines as we plan the member communication plan. You know, we're going to tell them this first and then two weeks later we're going to tell them this and then we'll tell them this. You know, we really have to lay out the pharmacy communications in a similar way because there's just a, a lot of information and we don't want any of it to get lost in the shuffle. Um, and um, we don't want it to be sort of, oh, here's the facts that you got um, on Christmas Eve when you weren't really looking for it. Um, so, you know, we just want to be really thoughtful about that. Um, and we'll continue to work with the trade associations, the ships, um, and others. Um, the other couple of things I'll, I'll note that aren't, you know, aren't really here, but just because they're new this year, you know, we've got the new directory notice communication um, that's a requirement for this year. So another thing that we did is we worked with CMS to come up with some additional, you know, just an additional sentence or two that we added to the directory notice to, to say, hey, our pharmacy network's changing. You should be aware of this. And, and just, you know, because it's a communication about directories, about networks, we want to make sure that that, um, you know, we take advantage of that communication vehicle to, to try to communicate it again. You know, it's just another way of trying to surround the member um, with that information. Um, and, you know, because we're, we're simplifying the network, you know, again, it's, it's still changed, so we will still have members whose pharmacies will change status and move. Um, and for anyone who's, whose pharmacy is out of network on the first of the year that's in network this year, you know, we're sending them a very detailed letter with that information. We're sending them a pharmacy directory um, so they can see the full set of choices available to them. 
um, and you know, of course, we'll we'll be calling them through our, our outbound campaign. So we you know we've tried to also look at you know not just our own experience, but also other things like the directories um, and how can we take advantage of that and and use it to um, you know to help our members. Um, and then the, the the last couple of pages in the deck here, I'm, I'm not going to go through these in a lot of detail because I kind of just talked about it, but what, what you really see here is um, kind of what we did in 15 and what's different in 16. So, you know, it's not like we just dreamed up all of this stuff for 1116. These are things that we added over the course of 2015 and are now... Um, able to fully deploy, fully utilize as we approach our 2016 changes. Um, you know, the only thing that's really net new for, for 1116 is the, um, uh, the directory notice that we just talked about. So, um, you know, we will still have changes. We will be communicating them and we'll continue to do all of the, um, you know, kind of the best practices that we've learned over the course of the year, um, not just as we communicate with our members about pharmacy network changes, but really as we communicate with our members in general because we you know this has been a very valuable learning experience um i i know that um our colleagues at cms want us to emphasize to all of um all of the rest of you guys it's hard to get to members it's hard to reach them all it's hard to get them to change their behavior some of them they're just not going to make a change until they're they're in a an action forcing situation um so Sometimes the rejected claim has to happen, um, but then it's how you respond, how you help them, um, and the options that you have available to them, you know, to, to get them through that process, because not everybody's going to respond to your calls and letters, um, so you can't stop there, I guess, at your, at your calls and letters. You've you, you got to think of it as the, how do I get them ready for the change? What happens when that event happens, and what am I going to do after that event to take care of them um, and, and help them get the access that they need? Thank you, Terry and John. Um, I think I just want to add a couple highlights from how, what you were discussing. Um, some, some of you have already approached CMS with some changes that you're anticipating for 2016 and have already heard our change in dialogue um, based on our experiences in the last nine months working through some of these um, challenges that we've had with reaching beneficiaries and specifically pharmacies that uh, we were had our eyes opened a bit to how contracting happens with pharmacies and items that we thought were were solid assumptions that pharmacies know exactly what plans they're in network for at the start of the annual enrollment period actually weren't true um, and that in order for them to better serve and provide the Part D benefit we need to communicate very clearly so that they can answer the question when a beneficiary calls and says, are you in network for, in this case, Aetna? It used to be yes or no. Um, it is, it's about to be closer to yes and no for Aetna again, but that changed last fall. And the inbound complaint that we got was from a single pharmacy. And so for those of you responsible for monitoring complaints, whether they come in through CTM or through your own um, call centers, you really need to have someone who is intuitively aware when an interesting question comes in and need to be able to ask the question, not just in terms of yes or no, this is how it should be, but why are they asking that? Um, it was this one pharmacy actually that highlighted to us that something was really different. Uh, and we brought that immediately to John's attention, actually. He was on site for, uh, for a separate meeting um, and talked to him directly. So that, that ability to be in contact with, your, with you and your compliance officers um, and folks that are relevant to pharmacy networks and beneficiary outreach is really important. And um, it is a big piece of what we'll be asking of you as you're making changes in your delivery of care. I think we're ready for mm -hmm. questions at this time, if, you, if there are any. Hi, good morning. Uh, Scott Levine, um, Affinity Health Plan. First of all, thank you. I think this is incredibly useful information for anyone who's thinking about making changes to their network. Um, I'm curious, did you find there was an issue for, for members who had to change pharmacies, an issue with prescriptions? and if there was, was there any kind of strategy you used 
for addressing that. An issue with their prescri prescriptions. Prescriptions, yeah. Changing in, prescriptions. In terms of forwarding it to an in-network pharmacy? Or? Yeah, or in, in which they had a standing prescription at the old pharmacy. They need to go to a new pharmacy. They didn't want to contact the doctor. You know, those kinds of issues. Was that an issue or it really was not? Um, it, it doesn't seem to have been an issue. So for the people who have wanted to make a change, and, and um, this is interesting also, you know, the, right away in 2015, we actually saw an uptick in the use of our preferred pharmacies. Um, and so those communications, while they weren't 100% effective for everything um, or every situation, you know, we, we think they were impactful for some people you know, encouraging them to, to go use a preferred pharmacy where they could get a, you know, a, a better cost share. Um, so, you know, so we know the prescription transfers were happening. Um, we didn't get any um, complaints about them. It's, it's actually something that we talked about with CMS very early on. We said, how, you know, how far as a health plan, how far can we go, you know, to help mm -hmm. enable this prescription transfer process? Right. And, and, and we did, you know, kind of need to draw a line there and, and let the pharmacies work that out. But, um, but we didn't really receive complaints um, okay. from anyone about not being able to make that transfer. I, I think Great. once the pharmacies understand what the, what the member wants or what their customer wants, they're very helpful good. to, That's to, good to those know. members. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we did receive some questions from our webcast audience. And the first question that we received is, the presentation slides indicated that the former Coventry members will remain in the expanded network throughout 2015. Is Aetna reaching out to those members as well? And what is Aetna's thinking about bringing those members into the appropriate network? Yeah, um, the, the operating environment that we're in in 2015 is a combined operating environment with two different PBMs. So that um, footnote on the slide is really kind of differentiating between um, what we can do operationally um, in one PBM versus the other PBM. Um, so yes, all of those members are part of our standard communications now. Um, they, when they shop at a um, gap, you know, what we call the gap network or a, a temporarily expanded network pharmacy. Um, every time they do it, they get a call from us that says, hey, you know, that pharmacy's not really in the network. You want to make a change? You know, can we help you? Um, they, so they're part of that um, communication process now, um, and they'll also be part of the, you know, kind of the more intensive communication process this fall because um, they will not be in that situation anymore um, as of 1116. They'll be in the, the standard network in 1116. Okay, thank you. Our next question. Ms. Swanson and Mr. Wells mentioned having specialized strategies for higher risk members and giving contact centers flexibility to ensure that members got the prescriptions as needed. What is the risk of CMS finding that the plans treated members inequitably? And if so, what remediation actions would CMS require? That's not a small question. Um, <laughs> I think that the, the starting point when we are addressing any of these concerns is the beneficiary. And so as much as we can make someone whole and complete and have access to their drugs, um, in particular in my world because it's the Part D benefit, but also on the MA side, um, we will move forward and ensure access to care first. In prime, in, as a primary function. And second to that, we would, we would need more information on how certain beneficiaries are being treated um, that others aren't. And so that would be, the worry might be that just off the bat, without doing the one-off thought, this is a beneficiary with a spe specific circumstance, but rather taking a whole group of beneficiaries and saying they're special and I'm just going to put them over here. And that's where things start to get complicated and we bump into administering a benefit that wasn't approved. And one of the benefits of working so closely with, with Aetna and specifically the colleagues to the left uh, um, was that we got very used to 
each other's thought process during this. We started to anticipate some of the questions that might arise either from the pharmacies or the beneficiaries or even from my um, group director and deputy group director on what we needed to address before we even got to the conversation point. So I think that the when you start to treat a group differently than expected, you really need to be having conversations with us. When you are having individual discussions with a specific beneficiary, we call that individualized care to the point that you're still operating within the confines of our requirements. Okay. Next question that we have received. You invested in a number of member outreach strategies. Of these, which do you think was most effective? Well, uh, you know, really, uh, again, it's the combination of strategies, no single bullet, no single strategy. Um, if I had to say, you know, where would I differentiate, I, I think for outbound calling, um, the more personal um, and data-driven you can make the conversation, the better. So, you know, don't just make the call, make the call and make sure you're arming those customer service representatives with specific information about that beneficiary and their circumstances um, so that it can be a very meaningful call. Same thing with the letters. Um, Medicare beneficiaries, many of them do respond to, to uh, hard copy mailings. They read them, um, they look at them, and rather than you know invest your money in, in sending a letter to a million people, invest a little bit more and make it a very personal letter and send it to those people um, would be my advice. The more personal and specific you can make it, um, the better um, your response rate is gonna be. I also think it's important to um, look at some of the known differences in the groups of beneficiaries. We didn't talk about what happened with the low income subsidy group, but they had a different reaction to your attempts at communication than others. I don't know if you wanna share some of those thoughts. I can help remember some Yeah, well, of I mean, we had different <laughs> response rates, certainly yeah. in the different, um, you know, we had different response rates in the different populations, um, and we did employ alternative strategies, like when we couldn't get a response rate from the member, um, again, about that prescription, you know, we're worried about this prescription being filled. You know, we called their pharmacy um, and to see if the pharmacy could get them back through the Which door. Which was a strategy so. we used with the low income subsidy mm -hmm. members because we couldn't reach them. So we were, we spoke quite often with their pharmacies on how we can assist them. And, and they were very helpful because they interacted with okay. that member. So. Um, and I just wanted, yeah. just another thought came into my mind that, um, as you are um, working on the communication strategies, it is okay to compartmentalize like beneficiaries and look at the geographic setup for those beneficiaries. Um, I think that we saw a great turn towards the positive side in CTMs when very, we've said this a million times, very specific, you are this person, we see you're doing this, please go to one of these pharmacies or call us. That is actually where I think you got the most, the most Absolutely. reaction um, and action. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, our next question. I don't see any of our in-house guests at the microphone, so I'll keep going. Can you talk a little bit more about contingency and scenario planning? What best practices would you suggest in this regard? Well, um, yeah, we've, we actually do a lot of contingency planning in a lot of different contexts. So I'm, you know, I'll maybe broaden my answer a, a little bit beyond just this, um, you know, kind of this network situation um, to, to more general contingency planning. Um, just as a, a, for instance, you know, we had a claims platform migration last year. We've got another one coming up this year. Um, that's a very large, complicated project, um, and we, want to be very prepared for all contingencies. Um, so, you know, as, as John mentioned in some of his remarks, one of the big things with contingency planning is recognizing where the areas of risk are um, and then ranking those risks in terms of how high a likelihood are they um, and what would be the impact um, if it happened. And then you can kind of rack and stack those um, and, and build actual, you know, very specific contingency plans um, for each one some might be more detailed than others. Um, you know, for example, in this network situation, like I said, we, we now have a plan um, in conjunction with our PBM that says, you know, within 24 hours notice, I can expand the network. I didn't have that um, 
a year ago or you know whatever. So um, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's specific to this issue on contingency planning, as we look to move members back into their network from the broad network, we had contingencies, we set dates, we said no, we need to move the date, consulted with everyone, we'd move the date, and when we actually turned it on, we would watch very closely to see what the noise or reaction was if we needed to tr go back to the broad network. So we. We recognized through the process that while we wanted to do things in a certain time frame, it may take longer and we had to have various dates to do that. We were also looking for our membership in terms of what was going to happen in the last quarter of 2015 and how to get them to the right network prior to that time. The, the other one, I know there's another question, but what, you know, whether comment I, I want to make on contingency um, that I would suggest is that it's also a lot of times when you think about contingency planning, it, it becomes a bit of an operational exercise. And so the other um, advice I guess that I would offer is don't consider it just operational contingencies, but engage um, others in your organization, you know, your government relations people, your state relations people, media, um, you know, talk to CMS, talk, talk to other talk to other plans, you know, about what have you seen um, are, am I seeing all the risks or am, am I having some blind spots here? I think the, the broader your constituent base, the more likely you are to identify all of those potential risk areas and then you can, like I said, sort of prioritize and, and address them in your planning process. Okay, we do have a question in house here, so please go ahead. Hi, I'm Lynn Wardinger with Geisinger Health Plan and we are planning some uh, network changes for 2016 with our pharmacies and also with some medical providers as well. Um, who at CMS should we be working with on those changes? The changes we're going to be doing aren't nearly at the scale that you've done, but we want to make sure we get it right. Absolutely, your account manager. Um, you can also check in with your account manager and make sure that they're getting in touch with me in particular. I think I'm a good conduit, Linda Anders. Um, and I can always direct um, the Part D questions because it'll get very specific. It'll get down to policy questions. It'll come down to formulary and it'll come down to a lot of, a, a lot of nitty gritty pieces. Um, and uh, Kathy Baldwin um, and her team in uh, MCAG in the division of Medicare Advantage Operations. Um, her team, would they have a mailbox. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but your account manager has a nice resource, a list that they can use to uh, find the right person. Um, and then Kathy and I do a pretty good job in, the, in between that. But okay. If I can just elaborate on that. It, from our perspective, it was very important to include both our regional office, our account manager, and the team out there as well as central office and all activities we were doing. And so even if they could, one side or the other could make a meeting, we would notify them, give them the key details so they go on to keep all informed because clearly, I mean, CTMs and other activities are performed in the regional office. They need to be aware of those. Mm -hmm. So we spent time not only with our account manager, but with the you know, administrator's office and in in our regional office as well working on those. Okay. Well, you've given us some really good uh, tips, so thank you very much. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our session. So I would like to at this time thank Linda and Terry and John for sharing with us today. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Division of Health Plan Innovation at the CMS Innovation Center will provide an overview of the CMMI Division of Health Plan Innovation and the potential impacts of its work on Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D. I am happy to introduce to you Gregory Woods.
Okay, thank you. So, um, I will try and be uh, brief, uh, cognizant that uh, lunch is after this, and um, hopefully to leave some time for, for questions as well. Um, so I, I wanted to start my uh, presentation today just to giving a high-level overview of the CMS Innovation Center and the work we do. Uh, this may be familiar to many of you, but um, it, it may not be familiar to everyone. Um, so the, the, the Innovation Center was established by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it was a, a new office established uh, as part of that act. It, it, it was intended to serve as, uh, I think, the R&D arm of CMS. And uh, to, to further that mission, uh, the Innovation Center was given a, a dedicated recurring funding source uh, to, to test demonstrations or pilot programs or models, as we like to call them. Uh, the Innovation Center was also given fairly broad waiver authority to uh, waive Medicare and, in some cases, Medicaid, Medicaid statute or, or, or rules to, to test those models. Uh, and the Innovation Center also has fairly broad authority in the event that we test models or demonstrations that, that prove to be successful to expand, expand those models uh, uh, to, to uh, larger parts of the country or to additional providers and or, or, and or plans. So, uh, so there's a there's fairly broad authority under under the Innovation Center. Um, over the past several years, the Innovation Center has tested, has begun testing, or has in some cases uh, well along in testing a, a number of models. I've listed a few of them here on this slide, uh, f and you know I think many of you will probably be familiar with many of these. Um, for the most part, however, um, the Innovation Center has not to date focused on on health plans on either Part C or Part D. Uh, there, there is one exception to that, which is the uh, the financial alignment uh, dual dual eligible financial alignment model, the capitated model, which is sort of a, which is obviously an important model test, but is sort of sui generis. But we have not done very much to date, focused just on the uh, sort of general Medicare Advantage and Part D programs. Uh, so last year, that was identified as as a gap in some place that we we wanted to do additional work and uh, and and focus our resources in future. Um, as, part of that, as part of that effort, um, a team was assembled to, to begin thinking about uh, potential areas where we might want to innovate within, uh, within the health plan space. Um, we issued an RFI uh, last November, uh, which uh, requested public feedback on a number of potential model concepts, and we got very uh, robust and very helpful feedback uh, on those models, uh, or those potential model ideas. Um, and then sort of earlier this year, we formalized the team that had been working on health plan, uh, health plan topics into a, a division of health plan innovation, uh, which, which was created earlier this year and of which I am, I am the director. Um, and then last week, uh, in sort of a fortuitous timing for this conference, we were able to announce our first, uh, hopefully not last, but our first model in the health plan space, the Medicare Advantage value-based insurance design model. Um, but before I move on to talk about that model, which is going to be the primary focus of, of this uh, presentation, I, I did want to talk a little bit about sort of the broader work of the Division of Health Plan Innovation. Um, we are also actively considering and or developing potential models in additional areas uh, within the Medicare Advantage, Part D, and, and supplemental spaces. Um, I, I, just to name a few areas which we are potentially considering, um, they include uh, medication therapy management um, within the Part D benefit and whether there are uh, superior ways of delivering that benefit, um, telehealth models within Medicare Advantage, uh, ways of encouraging alternative payment models with providers within Medicare Advantage plans, uh, innovations in Medigap or supplemental coverage and, and whether there are ways to enhance that, uh, that product line. Uh, approaches and uh, approaches to maximize access or value for high-cost specialty drugs, uh, and various other approaches to improve access, quality, or cost. I, uh, having given that list, I should give some caveats. That's not an exhaustive list. Um, we are open to any and all ideas, and and conversely, be, you know, by ma by naming those topics, I, I certainly don't mean to imply that we will necessarily move forward with all or any of them. But I did want to give you a sense of of some of the things that, that we are currently thinking about and working on. Um, and, and on any of those topics or on any other topics, I would strongly encourage uh, all stakeholders who have, uh, who have input or feedback or suggestions to, to come to us with those. We, we would very much welcome that. I, um, on the cover of this slide deck, I put my personal email address. I would strongly encourage any feedback, input you have on potential future models uh, in the Part C, D, or, or any health plan space that if, if, if 
stakeholders reach out to us, we, we, that's really crucial to our mission and we very much appreciate that. Um, with that background, I'm going to move forward and for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the Medicare Advantage value-based insurance design model, um, which is the model that we, we publicly announced last week. Um, I should say that, you know, I'm in, in the time I have, I'm going to give a, a fairly high-level overview. Uh, however, there is a much more detailed model announcement that is on our website, on the Innovation Center website. It was also distributed through HPMS last week. Um, and so, you know, many, many more details are there, and I would encourage anyone who has interest in this model uh, to, to, move, to take a look at that. Um, so, uh, the, what is value-based insurance design? The, the core concepts behind this model are, A, uh, that health plan design should encourage the consumption of high value services. And by high value, we mean the services that sort of on a per dollar basis are most likely to improve beneficiary outcomes uh, and, and in, improve the quality of care. So that's number one. A and number two, that the definition of high value is likely not to be homogenous across all beneficiaries. That beneficiaries, w a high value service for one beneficiary is likely not to be a high value service for another, and that a key gradient uh, to differentiate between beneficiaries will be their clinical condition or their diagnoses. Um, and, and therefore, that benefit design should be clinically nuanced. That is to say that the benefit design for someone with one set of clinical conditions uh, may not be the ideal benefit design for someone with another set of clinical conditions. Um, clinically nuanced approaches like this, uh, those kinds of VBIT approaches have been tested uh, increasingly in employer and other product lines, as I think you know, many of you are aware. Uh, we, we have repeatedly heard that the existing Medicare Advantage uniformity rules are a significant barrier to testing these approaches in Medicare Advantage. Uh, and therefore, the model test that we, uh, we have announced is a limited waiver of the uniformity rules to allow uh, the, provi the, the provision of certain value-based insurance design benefits uh, within Medicare Advantage. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk with some more specificity about exactly what that means. Um, so a high-level overview of this model. This is a five-year model test um, starting January of 2017, starting in plan year 2017. Um, we, we wanted to make it a five-year model test both to ensure that we had adequate time to generate meaningful and valuable data, uh, and also because we are we're cognizant of the fact that many of the interventions uh, that, that will be, we hope will be offered under this model uh, may take multiple years to generate return, both in terms of patient outcomes and in terms of savings. Um, so we think five years is a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable length of time uh, to, to, to meet both of those goals. Um, we selected seven states um, to, for this model, this initial model test to take place in. Um, they're, they're listed on the slide. I know we've gotten many questions already about how we selected those states. I would say that, you know, this is a model test, so we, so we had to select a subset of, of the country to initially test it in. We, we chose these states to be representative on a, on a range of characteristics in terms of geography, in terms of demographics, in terms of MA penetration, LIS percentage, various things, so that uh, this model test will tell us something more broadly about what the impact of VBID would be were we to expand it, expand it as part of the Medicare Advantage program. Um, so, so that's sort of what drove those, um, those decisions. I understand that some folks have been disappointed that their state wasn't included, um, and I'm sorry about that. But, you know, the, the goal of this model is to test the impact of VBID, and if it is, in fact, successful, then a, a potential future step may be to expand to other states. Um, one, key, one key sort of general point that I would want to make about this model test, um, this is a test of flexibility. We are not specifying what, what interventions plans have to implement as part of this model test. Um, we, you know, we have put some guardrails and guidelines in place, but at the end of the day, we are offering regulatory flexibility to allow plans to test VBID. Plans will have to make decisions independently about which investments they think will have a positive return on investment, both in terms of quality and in terms of cost. Um, and, and sort of at the, at the end of the day, they are the key drivers. Um, you know, we think, we think it's important in the context of Medicare Advantage that the plans are the experts. They are the ones who are responsible for managing beneficiaries' care. And so we view this, again, as a test of flexibility, not as a prescriptive test uh, of, you know, specific interventions. Um, and, you know, we have, we, I think we've given a, some, guard, some guidelines. That there are a fairly broad range of things that could be tested. My expectation is one of the things we'll, we'll learn from, through this model test is what is actually of interest and what is actually successful. And probably some interventions will be more successful than others. Um, so, uh, for this, for the initial model test, we have selected seven, um, seven specific chronic conditions uh, where plans will be, uh, 
plans will have the ability to offer value-based insurance uh, designs. Uh, these conditions were selected because, number one, they, we wanted uh, conditions that had relatively high incidence. We didn't think it made sense, at least for an initial model test, to focus on uh, things you know, that, are, that are fairly rare. Number two, we wanted to choose conditions where we felt like there was a reasonable evidence base that there are interventions, that there are clinical interventions that can have uh, a, high, a high impact, uh, you know, either preventive or primary or secondary preventive uh, interventions, and you know, where we can see an impact both on either quality or cost or both within a reasonable uh, period of time. Um, I would say that we have defined the target conditions in terms of ICD-10 code. In the model announcement, we had a detailed list of the ICD-10 codes associated with each, each condition. Um, we would welcome feedback on that. We certainly didn't intend to be, to, to be tricky. We intended to, to sort of correctly identify uh, the codes that sort of in a common sense way would correspond with these conditions. That said, it's, it's certainly possible that, you know, that we've made a mistake either in incorrectly including or incorrectly excluding. Um, a code, and we would very much welcome from plans or other stakeholders any feedback if on reviewing that list you have, have concerns with the specific codes. Um, I, I would also say that we would encourage plans or other stakeholders to suggest additional target populations beyond those on this list. Uh, to appropriately set expectations, I think it's unlikely that we would be able uh, to add additional target populations in the first year of the model test, given the timelines to, to go live in 2017, but we're very open to considering uh, suggestions for additional populations for subsequent years. As I said, this is a five-year model test. Our expectation, as with most of the innovation-centered models, is that it will evolve and grow. Uh, there will be changes. So this is, a, this is an area uh, where we would, we would very much welcome stakeholder feedback. Um, I, I wanted to talk just briefly about some of the beneficiary protections uh, under this model. I think there are two really, two, there, there's a list here on the slide, but I, I think there are two really crucial points that I wanted to make. Um, first of all, that this is what we call a carrots, not a stick model. Um, beneficiaries who are in target populations and are en enrolled in participating MA plans can only benefit from this model. So they may be, sub they may be eligible for reduced cost sharing. Um, they may be eligible for additional supplemental benefits, but under no case can a beneficiary lose uh, supplemental benefits as a result of this model or, or face increased cost sharing. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's, from our point of view, that's a matter of basic fairness. We don't want people who have a specific condition to, to suffer uh, or to, to be eligible for fewer benefits um, as a result of that condition. So that's one one really important protection from our point of view. A second one that I, that I would just flag, and, and I think you know, this probably uh, may require more elaboration and there will be further discussions, but as a general principle, um, in most circumstances, we're not intending to permit marketing to potential enrollees, that is to say people who are not yet enrolled in an MA plan, um, focused on the VBID model. The, the goal of this model is to give plans additional tools to manage the beneficiaries they already have. Our goal is not to change the population who are enrolled either in a specific MA plan or in MA overall. Um, you know, I think there are concerns about both adverse selection um, and, and potential gaming. I, I think our, from our point of view, except in very limited circumstances, we are not going to permit marketing uh, around this intervention. So, so we view that as also an important beneficiary protection. So with that, I'd like to talk briefly uh, about the specific interventions that we are permitting under, uh, under this model. Um, and we have, we have separated those out into four broad categories. Um, you know, before I describe each of the categories, I think it's important to note that plans, again, this is a test of flexibility. Plans have the opportunity to choose one, two, three, or four of these categories. Plans have the opportunity to decide what specific interventions they would like to pursue. Um, within each of those categories. Um, and I would also say for each of the target populations, each of the disease conditions um, that, that uh, are included in the model, plans, plans interventions can vary along that dimension too. So the intervention for a diabetic need not be the same intervention for someone with CHF, obviously. Um, and so, so there's a lot of flexibility and ability to mix and match. And I, I should say, you know, plans can choose to participate for one disease condition. They can per choose to participate for all seven. And within each of those conditions, they can choose which specific category of intervention and, in fact, which specific intervention uh, they, they would like to pursue. Um, the first category, number one here, is reduced cost sharing for high value services, uh, supplies, or Part D drugs. I, I would tend to think of this as sort of the most basic vanilla version of value-based insurance design. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Examples of, 
of interventions that would be permissible under this category might be uh, lowered or waived copays for diabetics seeing a podiatrist or for getting an eye exam, um, or waive copays for ACE inhibitors with, for patients with a, with a past AMI. Um, I, again, I think this is sort of the simplest and, and sort of most generic version of VBID. Um, the second category here um, is reduced cost sharing for services from a high value provider. Um, you know, and this is distinct from sort of the general tiering permitted under Medicare Advantage and that this would be only for the targeted population. Um, so, you know, I, I think examples here might be if you had a, a PCP who was participating in a disease management program for diabetes or who had a strong track record on some of the key metrics for diabetics, copays could be waived for diabetics who chose to visit that PCP. Or an, another example would be in, in the case of uh, non-emergency cardiac surgery at a, that copays could be waived at a hospital that was a local, that was a center of excellence for cardiac care. Um, you know, I should say that in general, we will leave it up to plans uh, to, to come up with a definition of a high value provider. However, there will be some restrictions. Uh, one important thing to note is while, while cost can be part of the definition of uh, a high value provider, uh, high value providers cannot be defined exclusively in terms of cost. There also needs to be something on the quality quality side to make sure we're, we're talking about value, not just cost. Um, the, th the third category of interventions that's permissible under this model is reduced cost sharing for uh, patients who participate in a disease management program. Um, and these, you know, when we say disease management program, these are the existing programs that are permitted under Medicare Advantage rules. Um, so an example here is if a diabetic chose to participate in a disease management program or met with a met, met with a case manager X number of times, then that diabetic could have reduced copays for drugs uh, or services or for any any service. Um, you know, I, I, one point that I think I should make here is that the this intervention is restricted to participation. Um, we're not at this stage permitting. Uh, waiving copays based on achievement of specific biometric goals. So we're not, uh, it would be permissible, for instance, to allow it to waive copays based on a beneficiary participating in a weight loss program. It would not be permissible to condition the waiver of copays on that beneficiary actually achieving a specific weight loss goal. Um, and then the fourth category uh, is additional supplemental benefits for the targeted population. Uh, and here, um, you know, I think this is relatively straightforward. These are supplemental benefits. They would be, they would have to comply with the existing Medicare Advantage rules for supplemental benefits. The distinction here is that rather than requiring that those benefits be offered to all beneficiaries, they could be targeted specifically towards individuals with the specific diagnoses that we're, we are targeting. Um, so an example here might be uh, telehealth physician consultations for certain beneficiaries with chronic diseases. Uh, they could be offered only for those beneficiaries. Uh, or an, uh, another example might be um, uh, additional tobacco cessation for patients with COPD. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the, the application process. Um, so as I said, we released an announcement last week through HPMS on our website. Uh, that gives many of many more details than I have covered in this presentation. Um, we anticipate uh, releasing an RFA either later this month or very early next month. Um, we're putting the finishing touches on that. Um, uh, responses we think will be due in December 2015. I don't have specific dates, but sort of in terms of the larger time frame, our, our goal here is to both to, is to balance giving. Um, giving plans adequate time to complete applications and propose interventions. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, we want to make sure that we have sufficient time to review, uh, to, re to review applications, to request any changes such that the interventions are finalized and approved well in advance of the bid being due next for 2017 next June. Um, so I think, you know, this, we will provide specific dates obviously when we release the RFA, um, but this sort of hopefully will give you a, a high level sense of what kind of time frame we're talking about. Um, one point that I just wanted to draw out, and this is a, a way in which this model is distinct from many of the other innovation center models that have, have been tested to date, is that this application process is not competitive. Um, by that I mean that uh, every plan um, that is eligible to participate, and um, that's most MA plans, there are some specific requirements that you can review in the announcement. Um, every plan that is eligible to participate in one of the test states that comes to us with an acceptable proposal uh, will be approved. We're not picking the 10 best or 100 best most compelling proposals. 
this is a test of flexibility, and therefore we want to to maximize participation. Um, and you know, I think it, that will also guide our review of applications. You know, if if a plan submits an application that is uh, pretty close to something we would accept, but not not quite 100 percent there, our our we will make every effort to get to a place where we can get to yes. Um, so I'm going to conclude here. Um, you know, just I, I would just note, uh, as I said earlier, um, my personal email address is on the front of this presentation, and please feel free to reach out to me with any general thoughts about the work that the Innovation Center could be doing in the in the area of health plan innovation, not necessarily specific to this model, but to other potential models or brainstorms you might have. We welcome all of that feedback. There is also a specific mailbox, um, mavbid at cms.hhs.gov, that is specifically for feedback uh, on the mavbid model. Um, and please feel free to use that as well. We are checking that very regularly. And if there are questions, um, you know, we will we'll get back to you quickly if, for any input that we get, get there. Um, so I will conclude there. Thank you very much for your time. And I, I think we maybe have time for questions. OK, do we have any questions from our in-house audience? All right, then I do have one from our virtual audience that came in, and that question is as follows. Would it be possible to share an exact time frame for the VBID model test RFA process? The PowerPoints say the responses are due December 15th, and last week's memo says November 2015. To be ready, an organization needs to put a plan in place, and a deadline of November 1st would be very different than December 31st. It would be great to know the specific time frame. Thank you. So, well, first of all, I'm, I'm gratified that people are reading all of our documents so closely <laughs> that um, keeping us honest. I am not able today to give a very sp a, a precise time frame. As I said, I think you know we are planning to release the RFA. Um, by the end of September, and, and that will have specific time frames. I would say, you know, I think, as, as probably suggested by the fact that we said November one place and December another, if we're, if we're talking about November, it would be late November. It would not be November 1st. We recognize that the plans will need some time um, to, to complete applications and to develop their interventions. So I think um, we, would, we would be talking at earliest late November, and probably December is, is more likely. Uh, hi, Greg. Howard Shapiro, Alliance of Community Health Plans. Uh, am I correct that this is basically a one-time cycle? That is, applications this year for a five-year project. Um, we're not going to see a new cycle a year from now um, for another five-year cycle. Is that, is that correct? So this, this is a five-year model test, and that's, that's what we're contemplating at this point. However, I should say that plans that choose not to come in or are not able to come in in year one may come in in year two um, or year three. That, oh, okay. And again, this is consistent with our general approach to this model, which is that this is a test of flexibility. And, and an important point, I, I think maybe even more important than plans coming in uh, sort of the, who had not previously been part of the model, is that plans will have the ability each year as part of the annual process to modify their VBIT interventions. And we view this as a test of flexibility. Our expectation is that this is, plans may not get it exactly right the first time. And to the extent that plans propose a set of interventions and some of them are working and some of them are not, there will be an opportunity for each model year on the annual calendar year basis for plans to modify, modify their interventions. So uh, this is one five-year model test. but. What you propose for year one, you're not nailing yourself down. You can add new populations, add new interventions in subsequent years. Sort of any any of the flexibilities that exist can vary from year to year. So, but if you, if if a, if a plan applies next year, it is for a full five year test. Is that correct? And the second question is, will next year and subsequent subsequent years also be limited to the seven states? So next year and subsequent years, yes, will also be limited to the seven states. Uh, that, that's our plan at this moment, anyway. Um, in response to your first question, I, I think plans are not because, again, because this is flexible. This is a, flex, a test of flexibility. If a plan comes in either in year one or year two, they are not committing that they have to stay in for the entire test of the model. But we will we will consider that all part of the five-year test of flexibility and evaluate it on that basis. But 
you know, consistent with plans' ability to change their interventions from year one to year two, a plan could also decide that this model isn't working for them after a, 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 on a calendar year basis and, and stop participating. That, that would be, you know, that is allowed. Thank you. Okay, we are just about out of time for this session, so thank you for your questions, and I would like to also thank Greg for the update on CMMI. Thank you, Greg. Okay, we are now going to take a lunch break, and our lunch break will um, go until 12.10. We will start promptly at 12.10 today. For our in-person guests, please uh, visit the cafeteria downstairs. And if you pre-ordered your lunch, you can pick it up at the Jazz Man Cafe, which is right outside the cafeteria downstairs. So everyone enjoy your lunch. We'll see you back here at 12.10. Thank you.